From Deloitte's AI Institute, this is AI Ignition. A monthly chat about the human side of artificial intelligence with your host, Bina Amanov. We'll take a deep dive into the past, present, and future of AI, machine learning, neural networks, and other cutting edge technologies. Here's your host, Bina. Hi, my name is Bina Amanat, and I'm the Executive Director for Deloitte AI Institute. And today on AI Ignition, we have Greg Brockman, the co-founder and CTO of OpenAI, a research organization that aims to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. Welcome to the show, Greg. We are so excited to have you. Greg, I'm so happy to have you on AI Ignition today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So let's start with the current status of AI. AI is such a broad topic and you know you hear so much in the news about it. Everybody knows what you're doing at OpenAI. What do you think is the current status of AI today? So I think AI is definitely a field in transition, right? I mean, if you look at the history of the field, I think it's been the, you know, the, the gotten a reputation as the field of, of empty promises. And, uh, you know, you look back to the 50s and uh, people were were trying to figure out, hey, maybe the hardest problem is chess. And if we can solve chess, then we're going to solve all of AI and we'll have an artificial human and it'll be great. And in the 90s, chess came and went and it didn't really feel like our lives changed at all. And I think that 2012 was really the moment that things started to transition, right, with the creation of AlexNet, which was you know, the first, uh, you know, sort of convolutional network on, on GPU that was actually able to, to just meaningfully, meaningfully outperform everything else. It was the first time that, hey, like all of these, you know, you, you're a human, you think hard about a domain, you write down all the rules. All of those systems just were paled in comparison to what you could do by just have a neural net that just is kind of an architecture that can absorb whatever data you show it. And suddenly that's the best way of doing things in image recognition, right? And everyone kind of looked at it and said, okay, that's a cool trick, but hey, it's never going to work for language. It's never going to work for, you know, for, for machine translation. And it kind of has, right? Basically the whole past decade has been, okay, we're starting to see that for all of these areas that feel like, you know, machines have never really been able to touch them, you know, things like language, things like, like understanding what's, what's in a video, I, we're starting to be able to crack it. And the way we crack it, it's all with the same piece of technology. It's just a neural net. So that's all the background. That's where we've been. And I think GPT-3 is also a moment that shows a sea change in terms of what the tech can do. This is the first time where you take one of these big neural nets that's just, you know, it's basically just an architecture that you dump all this data into. And suddenly it's actually economically useful. Like people actually want to use our API to just talk to our model. And, you know, some people do it for fun, but actually many, many people are building businesses on top of it, right? That you, you have various uh, applications ranging from uh, assistants that help you write better copy, uh, whether it's, you know, A-B testing. And we actually have had a number of users do uh, pretty rigorous tests with GPT-3 versus human copywriters and found that actually GPT-3 does pretty, pretty, pretty darn well. Um, you have... Uh, I, you know, people who use it for, for games, right? Things like AI Dungeon, where you actually have an infinite dungeon, uh, like a D&D style game that is generated by this model. Uh, and there's a huge range of, of other applications, uh, such as people who are uh, trying to help tenants who receive, you know, eviction notices or other legal proceedings in very complex language, trying to summarize it and point out the, uh, the important points for people who don't have access to, to, to uh, their own legal counsel. And I think there's this huge variety of different things that people can do once you have a machine that can start to actually interact, you know, meet humans uh, in in the language that that we all operate in. And so I think that it's this exciting moment where you can actually train one of these networks and they're, they're actually economically useful. Yeah, no, so true. And I'm going to date myself here because I studied AI back in the late 80s, early 90s. And that time it was mostly theory. We didn't have access to massive amounts of data or the compute power that was needed. So it was mostly, you know, what was written in the books and, you know, ideas around it. And I am not kidding, but back then, even personalized marketing, which is so prevalent now, was considered, you know, to be too complex for a, a, an AI or any kind of software to do, right? But I also think that, you know, all of that work really re- laid a really good foundation. Like, you know, that there's there's always this joke that everything was invented by Schmidt Huber in the 90s, and it's not entirely false, right? That there's a couple of ideas that are out there now that are kind of, you know, totally new and unique 
and partly because we saw, hey, like when you actually build things in a certain way and we have this particular hardware architecture of a GPU that maybe doing massive parallelism in this particular way is useful and that's where a transformer comes from. But most of it I think is actually, you know, we basically have 70 years worth of people thinking super hard about the same neural net piece of technology we're using. And so we can just build on the shoulder of giants. That is so fascinating because, you know, I think in a way we were unencumbered by restrictions. So it was just ideas that, you know, that were spouting out what if this was real? What are all the possibilities? That, that's, yes. that's a great point. I never thought of it that way. I think that the thing that's, that I find most interesting about this field is that it doesn't comport with the way that we think science should go. Right. And you can really look back to the history of these debates between the connectionists, the people who basically said, hey, these neural nets, which are kind of this like, you know, if you squinted at a model of, of the information processing of the brain and then the people who are the symbolic systems, people who said we humans are really smart. We know how systems work. Let's just write down all the rules and try to like really engineer a system that, that operates like we do. And there were these great debates of which one was going to win. And it really looked in the 60s like these connectionist people were, were, were a bunch of hacks, right? That there was really this, this whole campaign waged with you know, books like the Perceptron and things like that to discredit all of them. And it really worked. And somehow the connectionist school of thought has just been this steady rising tide. Like, you know, we see that there's this, this, this smooth, continuous curve of increasing progress that's lasted for the past, you know, since 2012. But we actually did a study, too, where we extended it backwards. And we found that actually there's been a smooth exponential in terms of the increased performance of these networks over decades now. And I think that points to something really real uh, that's going on. And it's like, it's just so fascinating. Yes, yes. Now you work, uh, you know, you are looking at core AI. How do you see, you know, AI uh, creating new opportunities across industries? I think that this is really the most important question, right? You know, we think about AI. I actually think AI has a pretty bad brand. Like if you ask someone on the street what they think of AI, you're probably going to get some reference to a Hollywood movie or something about, uh, you know, worrying about how it will impact jobs or, or, or people's lives. And I think all of that is fair, right? I think it is actually really important to confront the downsides. But I think that the reason we work on it, the reason we're so excited to build it, the reason that we have a whole, you know, that OpenAI is a company dedicated to trying to build, you know, advanced AI is because we see the promise that it can bring, right? You, you, you think about, you know, I think that the real goal is to be able to build systems that can help us solve problems that are otherwise out of reach, right? You think about things like, I uh, think about healthcare, right? So I have, I have a very close friend who has a very rare medical condition. And every time he talks to a new specialist, they always bounce him to another specialist. And it's a real problem, right? That like, you know, he's often bounced back to the same person and that they're like, oh, well, there's this thing that they didn't consider. And imagine if you just had one doctor who just understood the whole extent of human medicine. Right? This is not something that feels outside of the realm of imagination, but we've been totally unable to achieve it. And I see that the direction we're going in so many fields is towards increased specialization. And so if we just had a way to integrate that information across domains, I think that we'd be able to build a much better, you know, much more capable systems. Uh, and you know, you think about things like education, right? I think everyone's got a story of that one teacher who really influenced them, who was so good, who really understood them. Why can't all of our teachers be like that? And I think that the answer, you know, that I think that the, that the naive answer, by the way, is to say, okay, great, that's what we want to build AI to do. That's what we want to, to, to really achieve is we just want to build the artificial teacher, we want to build the artificial uh, doctor. But I don't think that's actually quite the right thing. You know, maybe, maybe that's the long-term picture, but I think that the immediate-term picture is building tools that help our teachers become more effective, building tools that help our doctors become more effective, and building tools that help anyone who's engage in some creative pursuit or some passion or whatever activity it is that they're doing, give them tools that make them more effective. And I think that that's actually where we are right now. You look at something like GPT-3, or we have a new model called Dolly, which you, you type in some text and it generates uh, some, some pretty uh, uh, great, great images for you. These are tools that are really, you know, there's the Steve Jobs quote of computers or bicycles for your mind. Uh, I think that these tools are kind of like rocket ships for your mind, right? It's like, you know, it's almost like, think about, think about spell check, right? It's like, none of us really have to be spellers anymore. We've like removed the like mechanics of like, how do you like go from this idea in your head to words on a page? There's part of those mechanics that is just so much more efficient now. And I think that where we're going with these certainly generative AI technologies that are, that are actually working today, like these aren't, these aren't sci-fi, these are actually here, uh, that you're actually starting to see creative 
applications become way more effective, that way more of those mechanics and the brainstorming and the trying to just have someone there who you're able to bounce ideas off of, I think those things are starting to become something your computer can help with. Yes, yes. And, you know, there's so much to unpack there, Greg. Uh, you know, one of the trends that we've looked at is bespoke for millions, right? To what you're speaking about, whether it's healthcare or education, how do you provide that personalized service, but at scale, right? If you can provide personalized ed education, personalized healthcare by leveraging AI, but it is, you know, based on, but it's exactly made for you, customized just for that individual. So I, I think there is so much opportunity there. And since, you know, we've spoken about GPT-3 a few times, uh, you know, can you, uh, you know, explain uh, where we are with GPT-3? What are some of the applications that you're seeing in the real world that, uh, you know, that might have even, that seemed, might have seemed obvious to you, but some that actually caught you by surprise. Can you share yep. a little bit about the applications of GPT-3? Yep. And, and first of all, it's it's a funny thing because, you know, I'd say that building the GPT-3 API was probably the hardest project I've ever worked on. And part of it was because it was a super hard technical problem, right? We basically had this research model that we had to productionize and make run really, really fast. But part of it was because we didn't know if it would be useful, right? There's lots of people who have built APIs for various models in the past. People tried it with AlexNet and none of those businesses worked, right? Because I think that the models just weren't capable enough, right? You have a great image recognition system. I mean, okay, a somewhat great image recognition system that can recognize up to a thousand categories and can be easily confused if, if, you, if you do something that's not quite what, what ImageNet looks like. You know, like no one wants to use that. No one wants to pay for it, certainly. Um, and it's not really going to, to, to move the needle. Um, and so with GPT-3, we were worried, maybe this just won't be a thing that's good enough. And we've been really pleasantly blown away by that. I, I think that, you know, in the early days we went around and we were sort of pitching this, this API to people. Uh, you know, I think back in January of last year, I, you know, I was driving around uh, uh, trying to, uh, to see if anyone would take a look at our thing. And everyone would look at the demo and they'd be like, oh, you know, this looks cool, but maybe, maybe it'll fit somewhere and kind of put it on the back burner. And we had a couple partners that really latched onto it, right? And I, I, I mentioned, uh, so AI Dungeon is, is an example of a, of, a, of a real early adopter who uh, they actually had taken GPT-2 when it was available. And, um, and actually, I remember when I first talked to them, they said, hey, like, you know, I think that all we really care about is just, you know, driving down the cost of, of inference. Um, and it turned out that actually the new technology we created was so compelling that people, uh, that it was actually fine if it was even more expensive to run. And it just turns out that, uh, that the capability had just, you know, sort of reached a level that even we were surprised uh, that, that people found so compelling. Um, you know, I think that, that, that uh, you know, one other area where we were totally surprised was in no code. And I think this was, you know, something that a lot of people have seen because some of these, uh, you know, people doing these demos, I, I ended up with some very viral tweets um, because it's very compelling, right? You just say to the machine, hey, I would like the code for a web page that, you know, has a red button and that you click it and this thing happens. And then it actually generates the right code for it, right? And the thing about... It's, 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 it's really fascinating. And part of it is like it's a little navel gazy because, you know, obviously we ourselves are, are coders and a lot of the people who are going to consume this technology are coders. And so we're all excited about, hey, is there a tool that can help me code? But I think it really points to this, this area where, you know, back to how consumed we are, we all are by the mechanics of whatever field of endeavor we are in. Coding and typing at the keyboard and trying to translate from what's in my head and this natural language that we all think in into a way that the machine can understand, like that is a tedious part of the process. And you think about the whole history of computing has been trying to make it so that the machines meet us more where we are rather than us trying to type everything out in, in, in bytecode. And so I think that, that that was really cool to see people actually start to build companies around it. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen lots of, of copywriting startups, and I think that again, it's just the thing that's I think maybe the most interesting and exciting to me is to step back and say people are actually building businesses on this, right? It's not just like hey, you build like a throwaway project at a hackathon. <laughs> there are lots of people who have done that. Don't worry. But the thing that's really exciting to me is that there's people who are actually have lots of customers and are growing really fast and uh, that we're building a platform that is really sustaining an ecosystem. And I think that uh, it's also been really cool just to see 
We have a, uh, a developer community. It's about 30,000 people now who are in our, our developer Slack. And that's a lot of people that we're starting to touch across all over the world. And so I think that maybe for me, that's the exciting thing is that, you know, there's all these, these applications across this wide variety of different domains. There's somewhere we just don't work yet, right? And there's somewhere we're not ready to support them because they're such high stakes and that we, you know, we kind of need to go in with, with kid gloves to start. But I think that, that in the, all of these, these core applications, we're just seeing an amazing amount of activity and it's really cool to see and support. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm smiling because uh, you know I, I when I studied computer science, one of the first languages I studied was Pascal, and then there was COBOL and assembly language. You know, this heavy syntax languages, and you know, and then you know I get asked a lot, to, you know, by young students who want to study computer science. They're like, which la computer language should I learn? And I said, just wait for a few years. You won't need to, you know, understand the syntax or you know learn. The, uh, you know, a programming language, right? It'll almost will hit that point where the machine will write the programming language for you. You just have to articulate your vision and what product, what's your MVP that you want to see. So I, it's fascinating for me to hear that and how far we've come. I think, you know, just, uh, uh, and I know GPT-3, you developed and launched just past summer, right? And seeing this progress in such short time. But I had one more question on that. Like, unlike GPT-3's predecessors, GPT-1 or GPT-2, you know, you chose to not open source the model or the training data set, uh, opting instead to make it available through a commercial API. Uh, can you explain why did you choose to do that? Why, what was the reasoning? Yeah, so, you know, there's a couple of reasons, right? And, and you know, there's one which is the simplest reason in some ways, which is that we, we're trying to build a sustainable business and uh, that we, we want to make sure that we can support that business through a revenue stream. Um, but I think that the more interesting answer is that we've always been a bit of, you know, we've always had an internal conflict within ourselves trying to figure out how to really achieve the mission. Because on the one hand, we really believe that AI has all these benefits that, that are just out there waiting to be captured. And it's really important that those are brought to the world, right? Brought to, you know, in our charter, we say all of humanity. On the other hand, we know that these technologies are dual use, right? You know, it's not like, you know, you can't, you know, the, the, these models are so general, they can be used for positive, they can be used for negative, and it's quite hard to design a model that can only be used for one but not the other. And so you're really stuck in this dilemma, right? You open source a model, there's no undo button, right? And we really felt this keenly with GPT-2. That's the first time where we said, hey, we have a technology that we're not sure about. And, uh, you know, we chose to do a staged release for that one. And so there we, we sort of released the smallest one and over the course of a year released bigger and bigger ones as we could kind of see how the ecosystem adapted. And with GPT-3, I think we've kind of said, you know, I think we're in a world where we do feel like we need to be able to take responsibility for the uses. And so we actually have a whole team dedicated to the safety uh, side of this. And so uh, every time someone goes live, every time you see a GPT-3 user, uh, that that person has gone through our review process, uh, that we work pretty closely with all of our developers, and that we do something, you know, in some ways analogous to the stage release process with, with, with our users, and that, you know, often we'll approve them for a certain quota uh, and kind of see how that goes and then scale them up as, as, they, as they figure out their own way of controlling for the safety. Um, yeah. And I think that, that yeah, that the, that the answer is like, I think that it's not enough as a technologist just to build a technology and toss it into the world and say, hey, it's the world's problem to figure it out. Uh, I think that it is also on us to take responsibility uh, for how this, how this is going to impact society. And so I think that an API actually lets us have kind of the best of all worlds uh, and, and to, to really get it out there and, and uh, get people to be able to use it. Greg, I absolutely love what you said. You know, I'm often reminded of that remark from that movie, uh, Jurassic Park, just because your scientists could, they did, and they, uh, when they didn't pause and th think about it, right? And what you, yep. what you just shared is so powerful, right? It's not just about as technologists to build technology and put it out there and let uh, people choose to use in whichever way. And there will always be bad actors, Right. Yep. There will always be the positive things that you can do, but there will be negative things that can be done. And it's so important for us to make sure to put those guardrails in place up front and make that conscious decision. Right. Yep. Um, that that for me is so powerful. Uh, 
and I know, you know, uh, uh, OpenAI is uh, set up as a nonprofit. Could you explain why OpenAI status as a nonprofit is so significant? Yeah, so I think this one is also a very interesting internal conflict that we've had of really trying to figure out how do you build what you think is going to be the most transformative technology and you're really excited to build it, but you also feel like there's a lot of ways that it could go wrong, right? You, you want to make sure that, that, that you build it in the right way. And, you know, I think that, that you know, I, before OpenAI, I was, uh, you know, one of the, the founding employees at Stripe and, you know, I was there when we were four people and I uh, built that to 250 people and, you know, it's a very successful company now. And, uh, you know, I, I really believe in the capitalist system, right? I think that there's a lot of, of really amazing things that, that happen uh, by giving people the incentive to build successful companies, to build successful innovations. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of power in just saying, hey, just be a normal company and do things in the normal way. Um, you know, and I think that the great thing about nonprofit is that you can focus entirely on mission impact. Uh, but the downside is I think not that much happens in, in nonprofits. Um, and that, you know, I think that the problem with for-profits is that uh, when you have this infinite incentive to grow, that I think that that's where the problems begin. If you're already at scale and you just got to figure out how do I grow 2x this year, um, I think that, that at some point you got to start sacrificing focus on your mission. And so we really didn't feel like there was a good option available to us. And so we ended up doing something uh, that we designed kind of custom for our problem, but I think actually may be a good pattern for other transformative technologies or other kinds of, of, of companies that may grow to be very big if they're successful. And what, what we have is we have a nonprofit entity that, that is open AI that, that sort of governs everything. Um, and then we have a, uh, a, what we call a capped profit company that is a subsidiary of that. And so the cap profit, it has investors, it has employees who get equity, uh, so you can incentivize people in, in the traditional way to actually make this, this thing succeed. Um, but there's a limit, there's a cap. And beyond that point, uh, that, that further proceeds don't go back to your shareholders, they go to the nonprofit to benefit the world. And I think that this is like, I think it, it's, a, it's sort of a middle ground that I, I'm hopeful will both practically mean that we can build this successful system, right? We can build the system and actually deploy it and have customers and get it out into the world. Um, but it also at some point means that we don't have this infinite incentive to keep growing, which means that if we're already at scale and actually really deeply integrated into society, that I think we really can focus entirely on mission impact. And I think that that is, is I think, something that if you just look at the near, you know, recent history of technology companies, I think if there's kind of one core thing that I think went wrong, I think that incentive to grow is, is just really overwhelming. And it, it's not just at the top, right? It, it really is every single employee feeling like that's the thing that they have to do, worry about that stock price, uh, that I think that it becomes really hard to focus on anything else. This is, you know, this is well, so well thought out. And I agree with you. I think this is potentially how uh, you, you will see more companies where there is a for good part and then there is a capped for profit. It's, it's such a great model for companies to follow and actually stay true to providing ethical technology in a way which uh, benefits all of humanity. And I know it's part of a, a OpenAI's plan to distribute the benefits of AGI to all of humanity. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on what this mass distribution might look like? What prompted you to come up with this, this notion of uh, distribution to all humanity? Yeah, I think, I think the mechanics will be, I think a really interesting question, right? If we really do succeed and there's a lot of value that we're creating, I think figuring out what's the right way of getting this to everyone is gonna be a really important uh, and hard public conversation. Um, but I think that the thing that I think is, we can, we can see very clearly is like, the thing that we actually wanna produce is uh, we, wanna, we wanna build an amazing AGI service, right? We want AGI services that empower every individual. And whether that's, you know, the low cost doctors or tools for doctors, whether it's the low cost, you know, we talked about education as well. Um, I think that, that these services being easily accessible, available to everyone, like that's the kind of goal that we're shooting for. 
and I think there's definitely, you know, there's definitely the, the potential for if it's, you know, it could, like, I think we're, we're very interested in uh, things like universal basic income and the idea of, like, you know, maybe it's the case that there should, you know, if there's literally a, a bunch of, of dollars that are accruing to it, to the nonprofit, maybe that's something that's literally given, uh, you know, distributed to the world. Um, or maybe it's, it's more about really focusing on delivering the kinds of services I just described. But whatever it is, I think that, that, that figuring that out is going to really be integrated with the technology and the actual kinds of, of services we're able to deliver. Yeah. Can you share some of the other projects that you're working on? I think GPT-3 is very well known. I read up on DAL-E and I, you know, I love what you're doing there. Okay, maybe start with DAL-E, but share some of the other projects that you're working on. For sure. So, so DAL-E, I think is also quite, quite interesting, right? It's, you know, it's the funny thing about basically all these projects is that, you know, like everything is a neural net, right? You start off with, it's, Totally random, you pour in some data and out comes some good stuff. The theme that we're at now is the generative neural net, right? So you pour in some data and then you're able to get the neural net to generate things like the data you put in. And, you know, it's not just memorizing stuff or necessarily even just interpolating between things it's already seen. Um, it really kind of comes up with some pretty novel, uh, novel combinations and, and creations that you, you just can't really find in the data set. And so Dolly is, is a neural net where we trained it on text image pairs. So you're then able to type in a prompt and out comes an image that represents that prompt. Now, of course, it's not perfect, um, but it's also, but it's, it's quite good. And, you know, that there's a lot of these samples that are like, you know, that we, we asked it to generate a uh, picture of a baby daikon radish walking a dog in a tutu. And it actually generated a bunch of really awesome pictures like that. And they're certainly much better than I can do. Uh, and I also think, you know, one thing that to me is really exciting about Dolly is if you step back and think about why do people want to use these generative models at all, right? I think there's basically three reasons. Um, one is that they can give lower latency answers than a human could, right? And this is something like AI Dungeon, uh, you know, where the, you can't pay a human to sit over your shoulder and to like be a dungeon master for you as you're coming up with your fantasy game. Um, Two is that maybe they can generate things at bigger scale than humans could. And so that sounds a lot like web spam or other applications that we really don't want to support. Those are the kinds of things that, that we, we don't venture into with our API. Um, and then there's a third thing, which is that maybe the AI can come up with an answer or an artifact that a human couldn't, right? That is actually meaningfully new and different. And I think that Dolly is the first time where we've produced a technology that has that flavor. Uh, there's also, you know, so AlphaFold is a technology out of DeepMind that's starting to do solve the protein folding problem. And that is, again, a problem that, you know, is just like you're actually kind of cool with the machine going off for a day and thinking hard about a particular problem and coming back with, with an answer for you. And so I think that that's the real kind of like amazing milestone that, that we should all be shooting for now is, is AI that can actually generate novel artifacts or new answers to problems. Um, so that's Dolly. Uh, we have another project that I think kind of ha has an interesting tack or an interesting flavor of this, which is uh, GPTF. So this is our theorem proving system, and this is basically taking the GPT technology and just applying it to mathematical theorem proving. And uh, there we actually have been working very closely with the uh, with with the formal uh, theorem proving community and have come up with a bunch of proofs that are shorter than than the humans have come up with. And so if you actually look, there's this there's this GitHub repo where where I, where, where people accumulate these formalized proofs and that you can see that they're credited to all these different authors. And, you know, there's these people who spend a lot of their time trying to figure out how to shorten the proofs. And uh, now GPTF is a credited author in this, in this database as well. And I think that's really exciting because the thing that neural nets are supposed to be bad at is reasoning, right? That's the thing that we haven't really figured out. You ask GPT-3 a very logical puzzle, and it, it's probably pretty hit or miss whether you're, it'll get it right. And I think GPTF starts to really get at the point of how can we get neural nets, how can we get this technology that is able to, to really kind of get absorb all this common sense. How do we get it to use that common sense for a structured reasoning problem? And we're actually able to make some progress there. And I think that's really, really exciting. That's awesome. You know, there, there is, uh, so I live very much in the applied AI space. And one of the challenges that we live in, uh, the world that we live in today within the context of AI, there is a lot of research happening in the AI space like what open AI is doing, what's going on in academia. And then the, in the real world, you know, we, using technology that is still being developed and is not fully mature. 
what are some of the uh, you know options or what are some of the ways that the enterprise world can stay you know get more connected with the work that you're doing or what you know overall what's the best way for research and applied ai to stay aligned so that you know for for ai to thrive i i mean we have to figure that path out there is a lot of one off uh, you know partnerships that happen but what have you seen in your experience that works well i think you know that there's there's kind of a, i think it's a great question uh, and i think that you know we we do a lot of uh, we put in a lot of effort to communicate our results and uh, if you look at our blog, I think it's become, you know, one of the, 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 the blogs that a lot of people in the field read. And, you know, the funny thing about the blog is that I think it was a pretty big innovation when we started it. You know, that, that the way that people communicated was you put a paper in archive. And I think that that's great for communicating to, uh, you know, to the, the narrow set of people who uh, are directly working on what you do. Um, but I think if you want to really communicate more broadly and to really make these things more accessible to others, then you really got to put an additional effort to, to really communicate the meat of, of, your, of your work. Like one thing I think is, is really interesting is that my co-founder Ilya um, will, uh, whenever he reads a paper, he'll always say the same thing. He'll always be like, oh, it's a really simple idea. And he'll sum up the paper in one sentence, right? And I think that's basically how this field works is that the ideas are not deep and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think that, that uh, due to a lot of the incentives of, you know, the academic cycle and things like that, uh, which we, we generally try to just, you know, we're, that's not what we focus on, um, but I think a lot of people do, uh, that you, you sort of try to make your paper be as, seem as scholarly and deep as possible. Um, so anyway, I think that the number one is really focusing on that communication and focusing on the right, you know, the right goals for that communication. I think that the goal should be to get this thing into people's hands and to make it accessible and make it so they can understand what's going on. Yeah. And that's from the research side, right? What should companies do? You know, how do companies who are using AI and want to stay current? What is yep. the kind of and what does that? What do companies and the CEOs or the board members need to do to stay yep. more aligned? Yeah. Well, so I think I think that that staying up to date. I think you know. I, I first of all, just to step back, I think that kind of what we're going through right now, it's a little bit like thinking about the internet in the '90s, right? There's something that's coming. It's going to affect all of our businesses, right? I think every business is going to have AI in a real way. Like I think that people kind of thought this was happening in the, you know, in the 2010s and, and it kind of just didn't happen, right? But I think that, that, that you know, this decade, I think that we are going to see a real transition. And I think that, that you know, after that, uh, you know, more and more. So I, uh, rather than less and less. And so the question is, you know, you think about in the 90s, how could you have evaluated what the internet could do for your business and how could you be on top of it? And I think that the answer is there's actually way more, today there's way more information available out there than, than, than there was, right? You literally can go online and, and just look at all the different things that people are doing. I think that, that what we find with, um, with, with GPT-3 is that I think every business has a GPT-3 application within it, right? Every business is a language business. And you know, it may not be that GPT-3 is ready to actually solve that problem or to, to make enough progress on it that it's worth deploying. But I think that what we found is that, is that people are, are basically always able to find some area in their business where, where we can add value. And the, you know, AI right, right now is like a rising tide, right? It's kind of covering all of the problems at about the same rate. And so I think that, uh, that if you find one area, uh, you're probably going to find 10 more where, where these things can be applied. Because so I think that, that, that maybe maybe the answer is think about it like there's a there's a sea change that's coming uh, that you want to be probably on the leading edge of that rather than on the, on the trailing edge, and that one nice thing that's changing with things like GPT three is that you don't need to go out and hire a giant team of specialists, right? That you can actually use an API that doesn't require you to figure out how to run a bunch of GPUs and how to optimize them and, you know, to figure out, you know, different learning rate schedules or, you know, whatever, whatever other fanciness uh, might, might be required, um, that you can, you can use it like you would any other piece of technology. And so I think that, that uh, it's going to be different for every business, but I think that the basic ingredient of find, try to, to find the smallest problem that you think can, you know, you can, you can get value from and try it out and, and really get your hands dirty. I think that's probably the, the, the safest advice. Yeah, and, and you know, in addition to that, you know, the technologies like GPT-3 will obviously, there will be new roles that get created. There will be jobs, job descriptions that might change. Do you have a sense of what are some of the new roles? We spoke about the new businesses, but what are some of the new roles or 
what will uh, you know working with a powerful technology like gpt3 what will that look like yeah i actually have a, a personal story here i uh, so my older brother so he was in the army for six years he came, came back home and uh, i started to do journalism research and he needed a better tool to help him in that research to go and analyze all the news stories out there and yeah. uh, so he actually tried out GPT-3 for this and he just got so fascinated by it that he just like spent all of his time working with, with, with the technology. And uh, he actually kind of forgot about the journalism research and uh, just spent all his time trying to get GPT-3 to do new things. And he actually was able to get better performance on a bunch of tasks than we did. And now he actually is doing this full time. He's, uh, he's employed at a company uh, that works, that is built on GPT-3 and uh, that, that he is uh, doing this all day. And I think that to me, that's, I think, points to something really interesting, right? Which is we've got this new technology that's coming. There's going to be new skills required to extract the best performance from it and really understanding what it's like, where its strengths are, how to coax that intelligence that's in there in the machine, like that's going to be something that we just haven't seen before. And so I think that, that uh, you know, that I think there's going to be this really important role for people who, who are excited about that, who really wanna work closely with the technology and figure out what it can do. Um, and I think that that is, that, is, that is really cool because I think most technologies, it's kind of the other way around. We know exactly what it can do and you just got to figure out what it, you know, where it might fit within the business. And I think that here, simply figuring out what intelligence is in the, in the machine is itself a really important endeavor. Yes, that, that, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing, Greg. There is so much happening in the world of AI research and you, know, you are kind of spearheading a big part of it. How can people stay connected with you? Where can they follow you? What's the best way to stay engaged with the work that you're doing? So definitely the OpenAI blog is, is, is a great place. I, you know, I, I tweet about things uh, on, on Twitter uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I think that, that those are the main communication mechanisms that we, uh, that we really try to push everything out through. Greg, thanks again for being with us on the show today. And I wanted to thank our audience for tuning into AI Ignition. Be sure to stay connected with the Deloitte AI Institute for more AI research and insights. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Check out our AI Ignition page on the Deloitte AI Institute website for full video and podcast episodes. And tune in next time for more thought-provoking conversations with AI leaders around the world. This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to deloitte.com backslash about.